Hello and welcome to the third episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Friday the 15th of May 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We conclude our reading of Chapter 1, February 1848 to December 1851. If you like this reading group series and would like to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, you get two patron-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. If you don't have any spare dough, you can always help me out by spreading that good comedy word by giving me a sensational iTunes review. Okay, let's jump into the discussion. Last week we got halfway through the first chapter and we came to this part where Marx is now going to look at the three essential parts of the period that the book is discussing. Let's have a go. Who wants to have a go at reading some of this first part? Kyle, how do you feel about it? Uh, Sure. So... Let us recapitulate in general outline the phases that the French Revolution went through from February 24th, 1848 to December 1851. Three main periods are unmistakable. The February period, the period of the Constitution of the Republic or the Constituent National Assembly, May 1848 to May 28th, 1849, and the period of the Constitutional Republic or the Legislative National Assembly, May 28, 1849 to December 2nd, 1851. The first period, from February 24th, the overthrow of Louis Philippe, to May 4th, 1848, the meeting of the Constituent Assembly. The February period proper may be designated as the prologue of the revolution. Its character was officially expressed in the fact that the government it improvised itself declared that it was provisional. And like the government, everything that was mentioned, attempted, or enunciated during this period proclaimed itself to be only provisional. Nobody and nothing ventured to lay any claim to the right of existence and of real action. All the elements that had prepared or determined the revolution, the dynastic opposition, the Republican bourgeoisie, the democratic Republican petty bourgeoisie, and the social democratic workers provisionally found their place in the February government. It could not be otherwise. The February days originally intended an electoral reform by which the circle of the politically privileged among the possessing class itself was to be widened and the exclusive domination of the aristocracy of finance overthrown. When it came to the actual conflict, however, when the people mounted the barricades, the National Guard maintained a passive attitude. The army offered no serious resistance and the monarchy ran away. The Republic appeared to be a matter of course. Every party construed in its own way. Having secured it arms in hand, the proletariat impressed its stamp upon it and proclaimed it to be a social Republic. There was thus indicated the general content of the modern revolution, a content which was in most singular contradiction to everything that, with the material available, with the degree of education attained by the masses, under the given circumstances and relations could immediately be realized in practice. On the other hand, the claims of all the remaining elements that had collaborated in the February Revolution were recognized by the lion's share they obtained in the government. In no period, therefore, do we find a more confused mixture of high-flown phrases and actual uncertainty and clumsiness, of more enthusiastic striving for innovation and more deeply rooted domination of the old routine, of more apparent harmony of the whole of society and more profound estrangement of its elements. While the Paris proletariat still reveled in the vision of the wide prospects that had opened before it and indulged in seriously meant discussions of social problems, the old powers of society had grouped themselves, assembled, reflected, and found unexpected support in the mass of the nation, the peasants and petty bourgeois, who all at once stormed onto the political stage after the barriers of the July monarchy had fallen. Okay, so how much of what Marx is describing here is a function of the historical memory of the first French Revolution and what happened there? I mean, we can start with barricades. 
I'm talking more about like, you know, the, the kind of the history of, you know, the, the terror and stuff that after the initial revolution, nobody wanted to be dynamic. They just wanted to wait and have everything confirmed in an election and a vote. And it, it, it seemed like that the memory of the original revolution took the dynamism from this revolution. Yeah, mm. but I think Marx probably also has a point in that the, the social composition of the revolutionary party was very motley and that did undermine what it was. It did undermine it even trying to formulate something beyond reviving the memory of the, the, the French revolution, the the first one. Right. I mean, and we have to put into context that, that the other European countries in 1848, which he's not writing about had similar Motley revolutions and Marx definitely experienced that firsthand. But, but a question for you is: Was the was the first French Revolution not motley also? Yeah, it was. But well, okay. So this is where it's a little bit vaguer. There was no real like the the the, the proletariat question in the first French Revolution is is like the proletariat question in the American Revolution. There kind of isn't one. Like, there's not a large wage owning class. The dispossessed classes of the first French Revolution, it's hard to say that they were actually proletariat. Does anyone disagree with me on that? Because, because they like the, the factories and all that weren't really there under, under the French absolutist system, not in the same way. Yeah, I think that's right. And like, there were certainly uh, radical artisans. But that's not the same thing as as proletarians, right? Like when the League of the the Just comes out and it turns into the Communist League, Engels writes that the leadership of the radical factions in France and in Germany were all radicalized artisans, but the proletarian class really only was really only emerging in Germany and existed in England, and that was about it. Were they not radicalized in in response to? The capitalist system emerging in England and pressure on their their jobs was it was it not like a function of of capitalism that they got ra- radicalized? Well, it was a function of the absolutist French states trying to uh, trying to outcompete capitalism, being unable to do it in the way it was organized. Because there's no like, uh, and I'm gonna be out myself as a total Robert Brennerite on this. It seems to me that the French the French absolute system, like the Spanish absolute system had to reinvest so much money into extraction and outright dominion that it couldn't reinvest into making its production more efficient. And this couldn't out, outcompete the capitalist and had to, to have way too much of a tax base. That's the general theory that Robert Brenner has for why, like, Spain and France's, you know, absolutist attempt to overcome feudal contradictions ended up, like, being too weighty and kind of collapsing. They were like they are actually modernist attempts. They're not truly feudal. Like absolutism is actually kind of a unique attempt to fix it. Banerjee, the Indian Marxist, also talks about this and and why the Spanish Empire didn't have the same fate as the the U.S. because of the the model it was based off of being similar. So properly speaking, yes, they're radicalized by the emergence of the capitalist system, but they are not yet proletarian. The first. Like the French bourgeois revolution is really what creates a mass proletarian class in France. Yeah, and speaking of the barricades, that's actually a later development in the early 19th century, right? Uh, When they overthrow the Bourbons. I think that was when the, the Paris barricades became like a proper tactical program. Yeah, that was the 1814 revolution. Yeah, my only point with barricades is it's not as if this is a this is a neutral kind of abstract form that comes about. It's a sort of cultural inheritance. Like without knowing enough about the history, the Brennerite take on this sort of thing uh, resonates with me. There's a sense in which is it like the old French Revolution is like proto proletarian or something. Yeah, it's mm. it's interesting because the the street fighters of Paris in the French Revolution kind of come to take on a proletarian image in later memory, right? We, we, we kind of lump them in with the proletariat, the sans-culottes and stuff, but uh, they're not actually uh, proletarians. 
So this isn't so much Brennerite as it is true. <laughs> right. I mean, well, it's both Bre the, the Brennerite is the larger historiographical framing. The truth of the class composition, I think, is like kind of undeniable. But the, 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 there's a problem with that in all the revolutions that we want to talk about, because also the Chinese and Russian revolutions weren't really led by proletariat that much either. The, right. the, their armies were largely at, at least in Russian, maybe 60 percent peasant, even though the proletarians really were like pretty much all on board. The Chinese case, like I think it was like mostly a peasant army. Yeah, totally. OK, does anybody want to talk about this sentence here? I've, I've underlined. Let me just read it. There was thus indicated the general content of the modern revolution a content which was in most singular contradiction to everything that, with the material available, with the degree of education attained by the masses, under the given circumstances and relations, could be immediately realized in practice. So what's he, what's he saying here? Is he saying that, like, the proles could never have got anywhere? Is that essentially what he's saying? Yeah, pretty much. I think we we kind of see this even in the commune later when the sort of... Blancists kind of seize control of the commune by the end, just because they have organization, they have a degree of uh, education that isn't held by the masses. It, it seems to me kind of unusual that Marx thought there would be actually communist revolution in his lifetime, a successful one. Or did, did he? Did he actually think that, given like that, most countries weren't going to be that developed proles? It really, yeah. really depends on what time period you're reading for Marx from and how much you extrapolate early stuff into later stuff. Because by the time you're reading um, Capital and during his writings, you know, in the Kirk of the Goethe program, he doesn't seem to sound like it's that close. But mm -hmm. in the stuff before, like in the in the stuff pre-1848, I think he thinks 1848 is it. I really do. Yeah, this is but, something that he thinks is coming during his lifetime for most of his lifetime. And then when he gets old, he's like, yeah, maybe it'll be in like, like 50 to 100 frame, years, I think maybe his, is what he probably thought. Yeah, his yeah. time frame is, is not our time frame. You know, in his in, in the sort of later phase of his life, that was during a kind of definite ebbing of revolutionary activity in uh, Europe as well. Right. I mean, you, you, and there's like a, there's kind of like an almost Thomas Aquinian like pessimism to the end of Marx's life because I mean, he mm -hmm. basically like just puts down the capital volumes and then doesn't really do anything but write letters to Ingalls for like 10 years and like kind of <laughs> keeps up with the S pay day. Anthropological uh, notebooks. You know, weird math notebooks, you know, stuff like that. But like he, he really sort of like just since, uh, since it's in letters to weigh in on, Goings on in the S pay day. Did he not have it, a stroke or something as well, though? Oh, he had bad health problems. So you don't know like how much that's reflected in in the letters. And I don't want to get too like bringing Mark's personal life into ideas, but it is fascinating to me that like when you read the letters to Vera Zurlik, he doesn't sound as sure that it's going to be immediate. But he does think that's the only path that Europe can go. And he's also d no longer sounds as wiggish that that's going to be the developmental pattern for the whole of the world, which he does early on. Because earlier Marx does have some like wiggish tendencies, like he almost thinks colonialism is progressive at first and all that. Esri, how do you feel about reading the next part? OK, I'll read this one. I don't mind. The second period from May 4th, 1848 to the end of May 1849 is the period of the Constitution, the foundation of the bourgeois republic. Immediately after the February days, had not only the dynastic opposition be surprised by the Republicans and the Republicans by the Socialists, but all France by Paris. The National Assembly, which met on the 4th of May, 1848, had emerged from the national elections and represented the nation. It was a living protest against the pretensions of the February days and was to reduce the results of the revolution to the bourgeois scale. In vain, the Paris proletariat, which immediately grasped the character of this National Assembly, attempted on May the 15th, a few days after it met, to negate its existence forcibly, to dissolve it, to disintegrate again into its constituent parts the organic form in which the proletariat was threatened by the reacting spirit of the nation. As is known, May 15th had no other result but that of removing Blanqui and his comrades 
That is, the real leaders of the proletarian party from the public stage for their entire duration of the cycle we are considering. Okay, people might remember we discussed Blanqui in the Mike McNair reading group strategy. He was kind of like the benevolent socialist dictator dude from Marx's time. Okay. It's, um, it surprised me to see uh, Blanqui getting the shout out from Marx as the real leader of the proletarian party. Well, yeah. he, he was. I think that the, the debates between Blanquiists and Marxists have to do with tactics, not with, with Blanqui's role in the French Revolution. Let, let's keep going. The bourgeoisie monarchy of Louis Philippe can be followed only by a bourgeois republic. That is to say, whereas a limited section of the bourgeoisie ruled in the name of the king, the whole of the bourgeoisie will now rule in the name of the people. The demands of the Paris proletariat are utopian nonsense, to which an end must be put. To this declaration of the Constituent National Assembly, the Paris proletariat replied with the June insurrection, the most colossal event in the history of European civil wars. The bourgeois republic triumphed. On its side stood the aristocracy of finance, the industrial bourgeoisie, the middle class, the petty bourgeois, the army, the lumpen proletariat organised as the mobile guard, the intellectual lights, the clergy and the rural population. On the side of the Paris proletariat stood none but itself. More than 3,000 insurgents were butchered after the victory and 15,000 were deported without trial. With this defeat, the proletariat passes into the background on the revolutionary stage. It attempts to press forward again on every occasion as soon as the movement appears to make a fresh start, but with ever decreased expenditure of strength and always slighter results. As soon as one of the social strata above it gets into revolutionary ferment, the proletariat enters into an alliance with it and so shares all the defeats that the different parties suffer one after another. But these subsequent blows become the weaker, the greater the surface of society over which they are distributed. The more important leaders of the proletariat in the assembly and in the press successively fall victim to the courts, and ever more equivocal figures come to head it. In part, it throws itself into doctrinaire experiments, exchange banks and workers' associations, hence into a movement in which it renounces the revolutionising of the old world by means of the latter's own great combined resources, and seeks rather to achieve its salvation behind society's back in private fashion with its limited conditions of existence, and hence necessarily suffers shipwreck. It seems to be unable to either to rediscover revolutionary greatness in itself or to win new energy from the connections newly entered into, until all classes with which it contended in June themselves lie prostrate beside it. But at least it succumbs with the honours of the great world historic struggle. Not only France, but all Europe trembles at the June earthquake while the ensuing defeats of the upper classes are so cheaply bought that they require barefaced exaggeration by the victorious party to be able to pass for events at all and become the more ignominious the further the defeated party is removed from the proletarian party. That, that, that paragraph, is, is that the greatest paragraph ever written on history? It's kind of a depressing paragraph <laughs> about the proletarian leadership like sinking into doctrinaire experiments and utopian like oblivion basically what we just... see all the time yeah yeah, yeah. this yeah. is a very familiar very familiar okay two words for you gar alparovitz anybody know gar alparovitz yeah 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 this is gar alparovitz familiar he's like uh the guy who who's written he's like an econ I think he's an economist who who, wrote, who writes stuff on like how in America you know there's so many cooperatives now and you know worker owned co-ops that it's like revolution through the back door like Chomsky's oh always shit about him. we did this on Swamp Side we did this guy it's like oh the same people who get all like a like a love boner for Madrigon even some Marxists do that's like Richard Wright does this too Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, yeah. Sorry, not Richard Wright. He's a black author who's dead. Richard Wolf is not dead. I met him in Boise. All right. Um, I think Richard Wright also played uh, defense for Liverpool in the 80s. Just right. thought I'd say that. Maybe different Richard Wright. Well, maybe, maybe not. Have I just killed? I've killed everything. I've killed everyone. <laughs> You just gave me coronavirus, Tom. 
It's like it's like the first time I've ever mentioned sport, and everybody just died. <laughs> what a group of nerds! Uh, <laughs> all right, well, you, mentioned, you, you, you <laughs> mentioned not only sport, you mentioned British sport, which which like we could give two shits about. Hey, Kyle I like British stand up comedy. I have a passing acquaintance with some terms of cricket. Kyle is in. Kyle is in the colony still. He they they probably watch British sport. Actually, you'd be surprised how little we watch British sport. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, the basically the cultural supremacy and domination was handed over quite officially, well, to semi-officially, to by, uh, from the British to the Americans during the end of the Second World War and slightly thereafter. So Canada became, you know, very America-focused and not British-focused. You go to somewhere yeah. like New Zealand, and it's a very different story. They're still totally 100% into British stuff there. I mean, I was, in the, I was in the car the other day, and we were going to the airport to fly down to Colorado. We heard that hockey practice was suspended for the whole league, and then we were like, oh, no, it's real now. <laughs> yeah. that, was my, that was my response, too, when the NBA and the NFL like, were like, nope. That was, Wow. You know, I come from the state that literally has its major, the major like patient zero for our state is actually the reason the NBA canceled. So, Utah lovely. Jazz. Yeah. Utah Jazz, yeah. Like, it affected me personally. Oh, my God. Like, no, it really did affect me personally. Like, not just that, you know, everyone calls it lockdown. So, yeah, I hate sports right now with a passion. It's not very pro of me, though. There's there's few things more pro than giving a shit about meaningless things that, like sports, but, you know. Consider the role of the individual in history, all right? And you look at that guy that touched all the mics in the Utah Jazz. I hate you. Okay, let's get back to the goddamn no text. No problem. Yeah. Oh, so- the Irishman's going to talk to us about getting back to the text. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and we're all too diseased to focus. We're at a low ebb today here, a low ebb. So basically, when the election came back in, the parliament that came back from the first elections was a lot more conservative than the revolutionaries who led it. And the proles in Paris pretty much figured this out pretty much straight away. And they decided to have another secondary revolution. And they got absolutely goddamn slaughtered. Worse than anything that was ever done in the terror or anything like that. But it's not remembered. It's funny why it's not remembered. Why do people, why do people think it's not remembered? I think it's overshadowed by the commune. Yeah, the exactly. Mass- the massacre of the commune was is is something that people aren't going to forget. It's because it's sandwiched between the first revolutionary terror and you know that that goes in every direction, and then you have the massacre of the commune and the you know the third French Revolution that this massacre is completely lost. But I would I would go so far as to say like non-Marxist types, like just normal people, have no idea of the of the Paris Commune. Uh, yeah, but not. But they have no idea about anything other than the terror, and they don't even know that the terror was aimed at the left of the Jacobins either. Tom's asking a larger ideological question of why, you know, that was a sarcastic was, one. But like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I mean, yeah. let, let's let's talk about this for a second. A, the, even though 1848 revolutions are arguably the the founding revolutions of the modern world, no one fucking remembers them. Whatever. No, just us. Yeah, I mean, like, like when you take, like, they're like a small footnote in AP in AP European history. Like that's like, like yeah. Well, because they were they were so abortive. It's they were they were a flash in the pan, right? They were successful failures, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it, they create modern liberalism. <laughs> and they also create almost all the modern European nation states except for France and England. So it's like... Yeah. <laughs> it, no, they're really consequential. It's just like kind of inherently deflationary. I think they kind of only... It's interesting. It, they kind of only explicitly frame subsequent history for leftists. But they really do frame the terms of debate going forward for pretty much everyone. Well, you look at you look at the German left during this period, and it's it's truly shambolic. The whole thing was a disaster. Well, let's have a look more into this. The sentence he he starts off with here is the the bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe can only followed by a bourgeois republic. 
so is is that a law by Marx? No, no, no. This is like speaking with the voice of the bourgeoisie. That's like when he when he switches to this declaration to this declaration of the Constituent National Assembly, the Paris proletariat replied with the June insurrection. He's kind of framing that previous statement as like, well, this is the sort of common sense of the bourgeoisie. And this is what the proletariats did in response. Yeah, he's throwing his voice. Or maybe not. You don't think so? I'm not sure. Let's chew on uh, this. I, I really think this is Marx throwing his voice, as you said. I don't um, know. I mean, like, I, I, I the, the, the utopia, like, let's look at the next statement. The demands of the Paris proletariat are utopian nonsense. I, I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. I, I kind of feel like he's saying something like, you know, that the bourgeois monarchy pretty much has to be followed by something like that on average. And, you know, like, that's the kind of step that you should expect. Now, I don't think it's a hard rule where he's saying, like, it definitely has to go next. But, like, I don't, yeah, it, the development. It, it, it is somewhat it, ambiguous. I do think, though, that, like, when we look at the whole thing about the poetry of the past and the poetry of the future, you know, there's a way in which going to a bourgeois republic would kind of be reiterating the phase of the first revolution, right? It's not exactly the same because at that point they didn't have a bourgeois monarchy, but it's still kind of following it, falling into a similar pattern. The interesting thing, though, is that he does say in the previous section that the proletariat was not ready to rule. So there's a real ambiguity here in terms of what is being said. Well, let's go back to the the ambiguity about Marx and the and like bourgeois revolution in general, right? Because that's an ambiguity that he has going all the way back to the 1848 revolutions, where he, he does see the bourgeois subjectitude as highly revolutionary and early bourgeois thinkers and revolutions he actually praises a lot i mean think about when he compares adam smith to prohune and like talks about how degenerate the late bourgeois, you know petty bourgeois thinkers were but it's also hard to square with stuff with stuff mark says in other places like i men mentioned those letters very azure like because they're really really they kind of take the the singular teleology of all history out of marx but maybe we should really go into this paragraph before we really discuss it. Do you want me to read it, Tom? Um, well, I just kind of wanted to discuss a little bit more first. Um, just this, this this bit here. Okay, let me just read this line here. Mm -hmm. On its side stood the aristocracy of finance, the industrial bourgeoisie, the middle class, the petty bourgeois, the army, the lumpen proletariat organizes the mobile guard, the intellectual lights, the clergy, and the rural population. You know, sometimes people, you know, and certainly I'm kind of guilty of it, you know, saying, oh, it's the workers and the capitalists. Like Marx is not a, like a, a crude class. He doesn't have a crude analysis of class. Like sometimes I know we, we, we always shout out Mike Duncan podcast, but he sometimes I think says that Marx has quite a crude understanding of the classes and how people act. Yeah, well, I think that's because he's off, offering off of liberal historiography of Marx and not actually dealing with how complicated this is because most Marxists, frankly, even a lot of good ones don't. I mean, when he po when right. he points out that like the aristocracy of finance is separate from the industrial bourgeoisie, and that the non-industrial bourgeoisie, by implication, is also separate from the industrial bourgeoisie, that the middle class, whatever that is, the petty bourgeoisie, the army, and the lumpen proletariat are all organ organized in certain you know in the mobile guard that there's actually a whole lot going on. One of the problems that I that I had when I tried to systematize Marx, because I always thought Marx was systematizable, and everyone talks about how all of his classes are defined by production, and for the most part, they kind of are. But actually, they're not. Like, they, it's not actually that clear. So, like, when, like, if you define the working class and the bourgeoisie are defined by their role in production, the lumpen aren't, clergy aren't, what counts as lumpen isn't, and that's like a that's like something that Marx kind of under theorizes and just sort of accepts. Clergy kind of are really, aren't they? They're a logical class. But what about the intellectual leaders? Like what the, the the thing is, if they're an ideological class, 
they're not a productive and class. I don't think like, ideological are, class is what's being stated here. The clergy had a specific relationship with the state. So if it's not ideological so much as it is, there's like political niches. Yeah, but Derek, they're, I think that's kind of what I mean. I think, you know, like it's some kind of weird. It's a relationship to state power, though. It's not a relationship to ideas. But also a relationship to their own material, holding on to their, you oh, know, yeah. literally their abbeys and their land and all that. So it does have a kind of production yeah. relation as well. Yeah, like intellectual lights, who do they clearly, like, yeah, they have patrons, but their patrons are all over the place. They don't have a singular clear class interest. So, like, the, listing off the class interests like this actually indicates that, like, in this one scenario, almost everybody, but maybe the peasants, although they kind of are too, if you actually read the history, are against the proletariat in France, like all the other classes. And if you read the manifesto, for example, a lot of those classes, including the petty bourgeois, are easily proletarianized. Like their interest could be in the interest of the proletariat, but at that moment, they are not. And that's kind of huge. So I, I really like the bit now we, we talked a bit earlier about, you know, talking about going behind people's backs and organizing. Like, is that not just, you know, the rejection of politics or of anarchism or stuff like you know, that's kind of a very key criticism of modern left. It's just, when I read this, every time I read this bit about, you know, trying to achieve the revolution behind its back, you know, that's kind of, is that not just the most damning statement about about modern uh, leftism? Well, modern leftism tends, tends to be either technocratic or blankiest, frankly. Are Lasallian, which you know doesn't come up in Dick's text, but comes up elsewhere, and those are all ways to try to backdoor through. Lasallianism tries to piggyback on the development of a national bourgeoisie and a national state. Blankeyism tries to do it by basically a covert terror campaign, just like Bakunism does. The others are like they're they're all kind of one neat trick views, like the NGO view. That's like we're just gonna kind of you know, NGO our way till we deal with this one issue and then somehow, you know, impossibilist up when that fails or or when we get it, we can switch our and show our real agenda. But like, honestly, and you know, I know my Leninist listeners and, and know my ambivalence about Lenin, but like, like that's the lesson most people learn from Lenin, kind of even, even though the Bolsheviks didn't do it that way, ironically, that seems to be what everyone thinks we should do is it's always some trick. I do have one thing to say about Mike Duncan is that his analysis changes when he does the Haitian revolution. That like changes him as a, as a thinker and like in terms of explaining like revolutions and that sort of thing. And it also changes the way he looks at Marx and Marxism. Right. Uh, Mike Duncan, I think at first he, ha he has a, an intelligent ax to grind with the Marxist tradition for making like history, you know, very neat and simple when it's not. When he actually like encounters more Marx and he's like chewing on an actual slave revolt, he can detach like a Marxian analysis from the Marxist historical tradition. And the, the people that really hate Duncan are the ones that are very attached to the Marxist historical writing tradition. The people who have the neat typological and teleological schemas who really hate history. History and like, <laughs> like, 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 for example, like, it's the, like Duncan's reading of the English Revolution actually kind of fits with Marx a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily fit with the clean, right. you know, this was the first step in the long progression towards communism. <laughs> um, and I don't think reading. Duncan knows that when he starts the revolution series. Yeah, no, no D Duncan was like a big liberal when he started the revolution series and. He really shifted over time. Because I'm still going through the earlier stuff. So, uh, you know, he he's like some of the French Revolution stuff to me was like, I was like, God damn liberal calling like the mob and all this stuff. I, you know, it really jarred with me listening to it. Yeah, it, he gets better on the later French revolutions. And by the like the Haitian Revolution seems to really change his historiography. I also think he was a liberal, but he was also coming from the perspective of understanding Roman history. And he also seems to understand Roman yeah. history a lot better. Like he also finished his graduate, like his graduate courses work while revolutions was really being developed. Right. So he has a much more advanced historiography in the later ones. Cause he writes them, I think after, I don't know if he wrote the early ones before or during. So, yeah. So yeah. In defense of Mike Duncan, 
because I also <laughs> think like I, there are better stuff that you can read, but if you if you're new to the to the history and you just want to get it down, like to me, like Duncan's better than saying like I don't know, wading through a bunch of Simon schema schema books and then going and reading Marx and stuff and then coming to some kind of intelligent conclusion yeah. about it. No, it's it's better than Marx's pamphlet brain and just it's like yeah. reading you know what your guru tells you to read. It's it's better. absolutely absolutely. Our yeah. our reading liberal like liberal popular works on it that are often pretty bad are we are well, already skeptical of those things as Marx says. Right. Well, yeah, but not, I don't know that there are some overclaims of the interesting, like a few, like I remember Zizek was, po- he was posting this book where maybe, you know, like the terror wasn't that bad. It didn't kill as many people as the American revolution. And I was like, because the American revolution was a, a war and B you're not actually, um, you're not including in those numbers, the war and the bond day. So you're being sketchy as that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, come on. But yeah, so let's move on. Let's move on. Derek, did you say you want to read this next paragraph? Sure. What, let's do it in a finite speed. The defeat of the June insurgents, to be sure, had now prepared, had leveled the ground on which the bourgeois republic could be founded and built up. But it had shown at the same time that in Europe that the questions at issue are other than the republic or monarchy. It revealed here that bourgeois republic signifies unlimited despotism of one class over other classes. It proved in the countries with an older civilization, with a developed formation of classes, with modern conditions of production, and with the intellectual consciousness and all the traditional ideas have been dissolved by the work of centuries. The Republic signifies, in general, the only political form of revolution of bourgeois society and not its conservative form of life, as, for example, in the United States of North America, where, though classes already exist, they had not yet become fixed, but continuously change and interchange their elements in constant flux. Where the modern means of production, instead of coinciding with a stagnant surplus population, rather compensate for the relative deficient deficiency of hands and heads, and where, finally, the feverish youthful movements of production, where they make the new world on its own, had left neither time nor opportunity for abolishing the old world spirit. This is where he, act, one of the few times Marx talks about North America that isn't like, because most of them are done by Engels, who says similar things, but usually says them clearer and more developedly. So what is he saying there? That the reason why the North American revolutions did not did not do this is because the classes in North America are not as fixed because basically the conditions of settler colonialism means that like there's new influxes of production material all the time and there's not enough people. So yes. there's not a clear surplus of people creating these class pressures that there is in Europe. Even though like he's not articulated in terms of settler colonialism, it's implied. Yeah, and it, it squares right. with what is said in the last chapter of Capital Volume 1, right? The chapter on, like, basically settler colonial cases where the opportunity for material expansion outward, outside of the grasp of sort of, like, structured class society of the European form allows for a kind of different... It allows for sort of, like, petty production, that kind of, like... um Jeffersonian sort of ideal, but also just like a, a bit of an escape from the pressures of capitalism in right. the immediate. And eventually, these event that freedom will be curtailed by the expansion of production. Right, because eventually we'll run out of land to buy off production time for. And what I always talk about, like the America had a class of the bourgeois pra and the class and the, like a and the party of the proto bourgeois the populist party because and that was true in most of the sort of colonial places actually because the land illusion gave this ability for people to believe that they were yeoman small producers so like this weird class formation that doesn't really exist even in europe outside of england for very long and because we could just throw land at people by taking it from other people that that was that was a possibility and also because of slavery holdings kind of doing this weird like antique production mode in the middle of industrialization which made it particularly brutal and engels states all this like more explicitly than marx does 
Um, Marx kind of talks about it as like a holdover of, of land problems, but Engels like goes into like, well, you know, most Americans don't really see themselves as proletariat because they have this land to believe that they're a yeoman class and they come from this English tradition that existed just, just prior, but isn't really a true thing in England, but kind of can be true in the United States for now, but won't be forever. Where does he write these? What books or letters are is that in? Engels writes it in letters, letters about the States. To anyone in particular or... This is one of the few oh. times you really see Marx talking about like classes in flux and I wish he wrote more about it. It's uh, it's an interesting thought world. I really like the fact that he just says very plainly here, it reveals that here the bourgeois republic signifies the unlimited despotism of one class over the others. You know, I, I think that's got to be, you look around today, you look at what's happening with the coronavirus, how they're reacting where the market is more important than the lives. And it's it's an explicit despotism of over other people. It's kind of, it's kind of shocking. It's, yeah. It, yeah, sometimes when I go on about like bourgeois institutions being qualitatively different and, you know, capitalist class society having like a specific character, people mistake it for me being like, oh, you know, these things are really meaningfully like, meaningfully democratic in like a, in like a way that I would stand by. But I mean, these are still class society institutions and there's still that basic divide. And well, ultimately, bourgeois society recreates this in it's really the least explicit kind of despotism that's ever existed. But it is still it is still like that. Yeah. And it's also true that 1848 is the moment which very clearly lays this out. Right. This is this is the the like kind of the definitive end of the heroic phase of the bourgeoisie in Europe. Right. Uh, but we still have a little bit of heroism left in the Americas. However, yeah. I found the letter. All right. So there was a series of letters between Ingalls and Serge uh, talking about like the hopes for a social democratic party in America and why it hadn't happened there. Even though they always talk about stuff that they had in America that like the Lasallians try to bring in and they're kind of pathetic. And it was uh, Serge and Kowski talking together. And I'll read this specific. It, it, he was writing from London in 1892, and he talked to a lot of Americans to do it. And he was talking about also the, the ossification of the two parties in America. So this is actually kind of, it hits on all of it. There is no place yet in America for a third party, I believe. The divergence of interest in the same class group is so great that in tremendous areas, the wholly different groups and interests are represented by each of the two big parties depending on the locality, and that each particular section of the possession class has its representatives in each of the two parties to a large degree. Today, big industry forms the core of the Republicans on the whole, and the big landowners from the South form the Democrats. The apparent haphazardness of this jumbling together is what provides the splendid soil for the corruption and plundering of the government that will flourish there so beautifully. Only when the land, the public land, is completely in the hands of speculators and the settlement of the land has become more difficult or false prey to gouging, only then, I think, will the time come with peaceful development for a third party. Land is the basis of speculation, and the American speculative mania and speculative opportunity are chief levers which hold the native-born worker in bondage to the bourgeoisie. Only when there is a generation of native-born workers that cannot expect anything from speculation, uh-oh, that's a side note, any, will there be any more that we have solid a foothold in America? But, of course, who can count on peaceful development in America? There are economic jumps there, like political ones in France, to be sure. They produce only momentarily retrogressions. The small farmer and the petty bourgeois will hardly ever succeed in forming a strong party. They consist of elements that change too rapidly. The farmer is the migratory farmer, farming two or three or four farms in succession in different stages and territories. Immigration and bankruptcy promote this change in personnel and economic dependence upon a creditor who hampers independence, but also make up for their the splendid element of politicians who speculate on their discontent in order to sell them to one of the big parties afterwards. The tendency of Yankees who are rehashing the greenback humbug is to result their theoretical backwardness and their Anglo-Saxon contempt for all theory. They are punished for this by the superstitious belief in every philosophical and economic absurdity by various religious sectarianisms and by idiotic economic experiments, out of which, however, certain bourgeois cliques will always profit. And there's another letter where he talks about the yeoman farmer thing in more detail, but that's what I was thinking about. They saw it. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a quote I, I was uh, hawking around during the 2016 election to people. 
it's made their ha- hair stand on end because it it resonates. Although, what is this greenback humbug? Isn't uh, isn't that like paper money? Yeah, like yeah, that's the greenback. <laughs> yeah, that'll yeah. never work. Yeah, uh, greenback humbug, paper money, and also MMT. Hmm. You don't to- don't forget uh, bringing back the the silver standard or bimetallicism. Another great one from that era. Absolutely. Okay. Here we are. During the June days, all classes and parties had united in the party of order against the proletarian class as the party of anarchy, of socialism, of communism. They had saved society from the enemies of society. They had given out the watchwords of the old society, property, family, religion, order, to their army as passwords, and had proclaimed to the counter-revolutionary crusaders, in this sign thou shalt conquer. From that moment, as soon as one of the numerous parties which gathered under the sign against the June insurgents seeks to hold the revolutionary battlefield in, in its own class interest, it goes down before the cry, property, family, religion, order. Society is saved just as often as the circle of its rulers contracts as a more exclusive interest is maintained against a wider one. Every demand of the simplest bourgeois financial reform of the most ordinary liberalism, of the most formal republicanism, of the most shallow democracy is simultaneously castigated as an attempt on society and stigmatized as socialism. And finally, the high priests of religion and order themselves are driven with kicks from their Pythian tripods, hauled out of their beds in the darkness of night, put in prison vans, thrown in dungeons or sent into exile. Their temple is raised to the ground Their mouths are sealed, their pens broken, their law torn to pieces in the name of religion, of property, of the family, of order. Bourgeois fanatics for order are shot down on their balconies by mobs of drunken soldiers, their domestic sanctuaries profaned, their houses bombarded for amusement in the name of property, of the family, of order. Finally, the scum of bourgeois society forms the holy phalanx of order and the hero Krapulinski installs himself in the Tuileries as the savior of society. Boo yakasha. I'm telling you, Kyle, Ezri has really laid the gauntlet down to your reading style. I can't <laughs> wait to see what you're going to have to do. To <laughs> we'll do there's, no, there's no French here, so it was all, it was all good. The this is my time, favorite right? paragraph of Marx, probably. You That's asked before, good. Tom. Uh, literally, it's every paragraph in this goddamn opening chapter I go. That's the best one ever. Like, it's very hard, like reading the stuff about everything is socialism or communism after going through the British election there last last year. <laughs> it's just like, literally, it's exactly like what was said. So I wanted to, you know, because I have some anti-political stuff on my mind, this whole like Marxist valorization of society, though, seems to be like kind of not a thing mm-hmm. here. What do you mean, Derek? Explain that. Marx doesn't valorize society here. The saviors of society are the bad guys. Like, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, like, the, the society becomes a conservative watchword. Marx sees a, a tendency to focus on society and, so, and, and social order, not just political order, as, as a conservative tendency. Which would make sense because all of history is, you know, the movement of class struggle. It's a series of modes of production. Like, th- that makes sense. Kyle, do you have anything to say on this this final paragraph? I mean, aside from the excellent uh, formal structure it's got, and and really showing the logic of the bourgeois strategy and like how it, it successively defeats itself again and again until finally we get autocracy. That's that's really impressive. I just wanted to mention this character, Krapulinski. It comes from this poem, The Two Knights. He's basically a, yeah, as it says here, a dissolute aristocrat, but he's like a Pole who's been kicked out of Poland and just kind of in his cups and, you know, despairing about uh, life, but saying, oh, yeah, it'll eventually work out. We'll get Poland back someday. Our, our, our sons will get it for us. And, uh, of course, he's referring here to Louis Bonaparte here, right? Who was also 
a dissolute aristocrat of a sort, right? He's he's known for gambling, as was mentioned earlier in the text. He's kind of a reformer in a sort of Saint Simonian way, but really was a bit of a figure of fun. And like his various attempts, his previous attempts at any kind of like seizing of power were very comedic in how uh, haphazard they were. Right. And while I often don't agree with Volker Marx's reading of the fascism, I will say one of the interesting things that they see in both Marxist authoritarianism, i.e. Stalinism, because they, you know, Trotsky has called that Bonapartism, and also in, in fascist and right populist authoritarianism, which get called Bonapartism, is that it often is from this sort of like deracinated elements of society that form their parapolitical base that a lot of these figures are also clownish when they first emerge and end up killing a bunch of people. The, the interesting thing though as well from that is that like the, the Bonaparte or whoever comes true, like even though the the bourgeoisie lost kind of control, they were they were still happy with them. They could get on with doing their business. And if we look at say Stalin like the probably the you know the actual like communist or the socialists, even though they had their problems with him, they were probably happy that he was going to even in a clownish fashion do the things that they wanted. you know there's something kind of i don't know parallel about the two situations well, the class composition is different because Stalin is like liquidating a bunch of these classes, like you know literally doing like some like mass murder <laughs> to yeah, like but it's, get the, rid well, of he's them. coming up but, on the but, back but it but it obs- but strangely, that obscures this this dynamic that is totally there. I don't know, because I, I, I agree with you, but in order to make this argument, you have to basically talk about the way that the Soviet Union tries to substitute for those classes, you know, like the state, like especially the Stalinist apparatus, like yeah, it, it, but at, they also, it's most monarchical. <laughs> but they also emerge from those classes. Like this is the other thing you have to look about, look at with that element of the Bolshevik leadership they come from the classes that they're complaining about almost to a man. They almost all come from relatively um, well off peasant backgrounds and stuff like that. Now I don't have any, like, I don't believe that your birth class is totally dependent on, you know, totally determinant on your personality or whatever, but that is not lost on me. And the other thing about Soviet society, and one of the reasons why I think a simple state capitalism argument doesn't really hold for it and, uh, and more complicated ones might, but is that bourgeois power is not really there. It's, it is substituted by the state as of these other classes. But there's also not really a clear proletarian interest because they're not truly wage earners. So that these other factions and tensions rise up that explain the class conflict within the Soviet Union. So it is an analogy to this, but it's not a perfect one. And it's hard to know what Trotsky was aware of. Also, Trotsky liked to... Like, I don't want to sound like a total Trotskyist. He, like, for a long time gets stuff wrong. Like, you can hear him railing against Bukharin and thinking Stalin's, Stalin might be reformable, you know, in the 30s. So, you know, he was wrong there. So then I want to say it's perfect. But the tendency, one of the things that late Trotsky says is, like, he doesn't think that it would have been a whole lot better if he'd have been in charge of the Soviet Union because of the class formations of the Soviet Union and the need to keep petty proprietors as a core of the technocratic leadership um, would have led to him being a Bonapartist figure too. Which is uh, very contrary to the usual folk understanding of Trotsky, right? Yeah, I mean, even Hillel right. Tickton, who should know better, like thought Trotsky was wrong about himself there. Like he just thought <laughs> Stalin, like he just thought Stalin was uniquely historically bad. And Hillel, uh, Hillel Tickton has also been uh, asked not to speak on his opinions about politics by the CPGB because of, I, I wonder why that is actually. I, I think it's, they say it's because he has kind of orth, ortho trot sort of tendencies and ortho Bolshevik tendencies, but I, I kind of wonder. Well, I think he probably does, except that he, he does, he is willing to say Trotsky is not ortho Trotsky enough, which is kind of funny. Well, d- didn't Marx say he wasn't a Marxist? Yeah, but too impossibleist. So something that resonates with this kind of Bonapartist stuff is the way that, and I understand in historical context that anarchism and socialism hadn't had their like big split yet, yada, yada, first international, I know. But here, 
All classes and parties had united in the party of order against the proletarian class as the party of anarchy, of socialism, of communism. How in the revolution, these things are all going to be kind of part of one thing. Like yeah, these aren't well, like tendencies that are going to be easily kind of like delineated and separated. Well, I mean, one of the things I talk about, other, I'm, I'm going to on Pop the Left soon, I'm going to do an episode of Ferdinand LaSalle, assuming we don't all die. One of the things I realized is, is like, one of the things that pissed Ingalls off at Kowski, even though Ingalls largely endorsed the Alfred program, was that one of the same things that Marx critiqued LaSalle for was over-reliance on the state and nationalization for their socialist programs, which I find fascinating because before 1848, Marx was pro that too. Mm-hmm. Right? If you actually read the Communist Manifesto, like there's a whole lot of nationalization stuff in there. After 1848, he's not. And he was much more sympathetic to general stateless actors. Although he, you know, later on he forms a kind of stage theory about removing the state. But at this point, like he's very frustrated with nationalizations and state projects. We, uh, is there any kind of general stuff people want to say or anything more on that last final paragraph? We could talk about how the slogans of, you know, these anti-socialist property, family, religion, order slogans end up becoming an engine for bourgeois fanatics for order. Well, they're the same slogans that still exist today, aren't they? They're nearly identical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. No change in content, like literally zero change in content. Or a zero change in form, maybe a huge change in content. Like what they mean by family is something very, very different. Mm. What mm. That's true. That's true. And, uh, what, and what do you mean by that, Derek? Well, the nuclear family is a is not the family that, that they would have been fighting to keep together. They would have been fighting something more like the you know like the the clan, the clan patriarchal model. And one of the reasons you know for that is is interesting because it's a different time period of bourgeois production where you know an agrarian family and getting around like wage labor and all that isn't going to be useful to you. Whereas back then it still would have been. So the, what I love about this is it points out that while the content doesn't seem to change, it's actually so damn vague that it can pretty much always be appealed to. But the form of the family is different, and you know, property now includes like like well, property know, includes a, a server AI. farm or something, and you yeah, know, order property, might include drones. <laughs> right. Well, property includes also like a whole lot of stuff that's IP, which is not commodity property. There was copyright back then as well, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah there's, there's same forms. forms. Well, yeah, but it being used in the way we use it, they didn't see that. We didn't see that till about 30 years ago. Like the fact that increasingly everything is in the form of rents, like that's a that's a way to get past the declining rate for profit and commodity production is to just lock everything in rent form until the economy crashes. Well, it's not because mm-hmm. you can't. It's just a way of siphoning surplus from certain sectors. It doesn't well, yeah. all increase the rate of profit. No, it doesn't, but it does make it seem like there's profit. It's a pretty good deception mechanism. Yeah, in, cer- in certain in certain sectors, yeah. I.e. tech and yeah, I.e. Fi- finance, yeah. where like half of us work. Yeah, it's just a uh, monopoly. It's not monopoly power. Okay, well, there's one thing I kind of wanted to say. I can't remember where it was we were talking about it. Like, uh, maybe it was when we were talking about like the weakness of the July monarchy. But like, it kind of reminds me of just looking at the Sander stuff at the moment. I know this sounds maybe cringy, but like the Democratic leadership itself just seems like the party itself just seems like really overripe and ready for something to happen to it. Any instincts from reading this stuff on American politics? Wanted to be Krapulinski, but couldn't pull it off. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, the same logic is at play but it doesn't mean the conditions are the same, are the same yeah, right yeah, yeah. it just it is like biden like like what? imagine biden as as that's what you said at the end of the last recording wasn't it the first the 18th the, the 18th premier of joe biden <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> when I edited that, I was laughing again. It just keeps coming back to me when we're reading this stuff. Glad, glad I could uh, have a witty phrase here and there. So, in order to, to prevent Trump from being reelected, 
it, it would take something as severe as coronavirus, I guess. Maybe even then. Like, do we have a lot of, like, uh, Marxists, like, writing about the Spanish flu? Like, that no, kind of thing? Actually, I was actually looking at so someone's like, are we in another revolutionary crisis? And I'm like, I can't think of where a plague or a pandemic led to a revolutionary crisis until there's actually abundance 10 years later from all the deaths. Seriously. Mm. What about the, the ones after World War One? Could you wrap up that in the Spanish flu as well as World War? You might can, but again, that's a, that's another like aftermath of creating space issue where like you see a, an economic boom, but it doesn't go to everyone. One of the other things that I've been pointing out as everyone's been talking about this workers movement stuff, workers movements really only grow during boom times because it's harder to scab. Particularly really interestingly when there's like crappy boom times, like the last current one, it makes good sense why there's a workers movement because it, there wasn't enough stuff going downward for people to really feel like they were benefiting, but there was enough jobs that people like didn't feel the need to scab on one another. So you did see a slight uptick in unionization and that's totally predictable where, you know, and so, yeah, I don't know. Like, I I think we don't really have a model for this and I have no idea what it's going to do electorally. I, I, I tend to think maybe we overestimate how much this may destroy Trump because some of his voter base don't, care but also a lot of that base is gonna, are going to be the people who have the highest death rates from this if it hits their community so i got no idea like i have no idea how this is going to go well and the real i mean we just talked about this uh tom and shane and i but uh, the real issue is uh what's the fallout of the financial crisis uh that this provokes yeah, because I don't. I I think while they they have bought us some uh, some time with that one point five trillion dollar injection, they have not reversed the situation, and all the stock analysts are saying stocks are going to be volatile as fuck for the next year, and bonds are bonds are being weird at moments now, and cryptos don't know what's going on. I mean, like everything is on fire. Furthermore, like the consumer economy is going to be limping along for. You know, people are saying emergency measures for a week or two. And I'm like, uh, this is like every epidemiologist says this is going to be at least three months. Yeah. That's we right. haven't seen that in America since the Great Depression. So, and in Canada either. And I don't think, may, like, Europe's different because the world wars caused that. But we didn't even stop down for that during the world wars. So, like, I don't know. Yeah. We have, uh, we have no idea what's coming. Um, yeah. I do. I mean, I do. I've seen the documentary oh, series The Walking Dead. Has anybody not, have you not seen that documentary <laughs> series? <laughs> well, to, to, just to actually answer your point a little bit, like the the Democrats are weak, but you know the, the old is dead, but the new has not yet been born. <laughs> right. This right. is exactly what that is, man. We yeah. are in, we are in right. weird, awful transition times. The other thing is like that the fallout from this, the really bad fallout mightn't actually happen until after the election for Trump in November. Yeah, that's what I'm actually thinking. And if we have Biden coming in and until a few days ago, I thought all this stuff was normal gaff machine stuff. The last Damn. few days, I'm not I don't know what's causing it. And I refuse to say it's dementia or sundowning or something, but like something's wrong. <laughs> like I've seen the man speak in person. And these Zoom videos and stuff he's doing, they're they're scary. So who knows? I, mean, I don't I don't think there's a way for Sanders to win anymore either. So I have no idea what's going to happen. Also, he they're all over in. seventy. They're primed to get oh yeah to, to get coronavirus and die. And you know, if Bolsonaro himself wasn't, at least one of his cabinet members was carrying, and everyone who and a lot of people who met with them have come down with the virus. So, like, oh, my God. Who knows what's going to happen? We the, thing no with, idea. the thing with Joe Biden that makes it look so bad, I feel, is that he squints and he's, like, looking in the distance like he's trying to see through cataracts. Like, there is, it's like an expression on his face that's nearly the worst thing that makes him look confused. I, I don't know. I think I think it, the worst part is when he mumbles how we need to reelect this November. <laughs> but that's just me. Yeah, I mean, like I, I saw him speak two years ago, and he did not sound like that. Like he could just be exhausted as well, you know. 
it well, could no, actually it, be really tough it, on the body. it could be it could be stress but the thing is you know like i don't but whenever we talk about the gerontocracy of the soviet union i'm just gonna say brezhnev was already dead before he was trump's age like our gerontocracy is gerontier gerontocracy or yeah. <laughs> the best that science will allow <laughs> yes <laughs> Sorry, I missed that with uh, General Intellect Unit and you, Tom. That sounded like a fun one. Yeah, that could have been. It got it got pretty wild. Tom Tom was Tom was <laughs> on one, really. You know. Yeah, I'm turned into a Stalinist. I'm telling you, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Yeah, let's see who survives for next week. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Gestures, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Music